We're now halfway through the four-year Olympic cycle. How would you rate the collective preparations across the sports as we prepare for a home Olympics in 2012? Look, I think we're in an exciting place. I think we've seen uh, our swimming team move on from Beijing. We're no longer the Rebecca Adlington show. We've seen some new stars emerge, and that's really exciting for us. Uh, we had the best ever European Championships just. Six gold, six silver, six bronze. That's unbelievable. We didn't expect anywhere near that. But what is equally exciting is the fact that our juniors are doing well, which means that the next wave coming through are pressing the seniors. And if you look across the board, also the junior divers are doing well, the synchro have made a massive step change, and the women's water polo have also made a big step up. And before someone asks, we've got some challenges around men's water polo, but we're working on it, we've got them out there, working hard, playing water polo in Europe, trying to get them match tough, ready for London. So I think we're in a good place, frankly. So much has been made at the London 2012 Olympics in terms of supporting sports, athletes and programmes to ensure Great Britain succeeds. What are the sports doing to ensure the progress made continues beyond 2012 and will this be affected by a lack of funding? Um, one of the strategic goals of British Swimming has been to set a goal for calling sustainable finance. Um, not only with our partners British Gas, but also um, in terms of our own activities as a sport to, to raise money. Uh, we are planning to minimise the effect of that. But if you're losing 20% of your funding, it clearly has to have an effect. But the, the answer to it is simply to focus on, on those that we feel we've got the best chance of being success. That may mean some hard decisions in the future, as we had to take with water polo a few years ago. But equally, you know, we've been able to work with them to Im improve things going forward. But I think the key thing is that we've set goals um, beyond uh, 2012. In fact, um, we've set a goal to be the best swimming nation in the world by 2020. That's something to aim for. And obviously, finance is going to be a critical part of that. Over the past years, British Swimming has worked hard to provide the strong international competition on home soil, first with the World Championships in 2008 and the Jewel in the Pool in 2009. What does the future for international competitions look like leading to and beyond 2012? We've mapped out a complete programme right out to 2022, believe it or not, of major events that we would like to bring to this country. I would just give you a, however a health warning on that a lot depends on attracting the public investment into that but some of the things we're looking at for example are bringing the European Championships to London in 2016 bringing the IPC European Championships into Glasgow in 2015 bringing uh, the World Shore Course back to these shores in 2018 to Liverpool and who knows what we'll be bidding for further out but immediately we're off to the states in 2011 for the jewel in the pool and the 2013 jewel in the pool will hopefully be back on these shores so there's lots to look forward to lots to talk about and lots to put on tv to show the public how good we are british swimming is currently on a high following our greatest ever results in 2009 and 2010 to date the vast majority of these successes have come from a golden generation of female athletes so what is british swimming doing to ensure the men attain the same level of success? Make the men incredibly jealous of the success that uh, the women are getting. Isn't it fantastic that our women athletes are actually leading the way, also knocking bits out of each other in terms of uh, a number competing successfully like Gemma and uh, Lizzie competing with each other in terms of, of these lead events. And, and I sense the men are looking at this and saying, hey, you know, we just can't let these, these girls get away with it. Um, and I hope it does have that. But we're also very encouraged by some of the young swimmers who are coming through, um, who are really beginning to demonstrate really good performance now. So I think our talent policy is right, um, and, and, and they will come. A bit short of tall male sprinters, but um, if Liam keeps paddling away well, then, uh, then we should be okay. But I think the key thing is the competitiveness in the team is really creating a great spirit. And at the end of the day, I'm sure that uh, they'll drag out um, really good performances from our men as well. Uh, the, the harsh reality is that it's easier to get the girls up. The ladies, it's much easier for, for a number of reasons. One, the crust is thinner. The number of world-class women athletes is less than there is in the men's team. 
Also, the women can actually train harder and get up faster. It's, it's a physiological fact. The men take longer, but the men are coming. The men are coming. We can see it in the junior program. We saw it in Budapest with the men starting to come through. It's just time. We'll be great in London. We'll be better in Rio if we can keep investing, but the men are coming. Trust me. Disability swimming has regularly enjoyed strong results at the highest international level, but what state is the sport in currently, and how can this be improved further? We've got a, a lot of pressure on us in some ways in disability swimming because they account for something like 50%, nearly 50% of the, the Paralympic, the total Paralympic medals, and that's some standard to keep up. Um, but we're, we're pretty pleased with uh, the progress that we're making, and I think particularly the recent management change when uh, John Atkinson came in to work with Tim um, within disability swimming really gives us some great strength and we can already see from the event in Eindhoven some encouraging signs and I know John is, uh, is optimistic about the depth of, of talent that we have across the range of categories which is quite immense in, uh, in disability swimming. So again it's the same standard that we apply to each of the sports. Um, the, in terms of our attention to detail and the planning that goes on and you know disability swimming is no different so we expect success significant success in 2012 I think I think disability swimming has got some challenges if I'm really honest with you I think we're, we're good there's no question about that we've achieved a great deal but I think the rest of the world are catching us up fast and in some cases they're overtaking us and I think there's a there's I came away from the recent World Championships concerned. I think we've got to really seriously address our talent development programme. I think that's been non-existent. I think we've got massive holes, particularly in the more severely disabled categories and particularly in the uh, visually impaired categories. And I think we've got to plug those holes. I think we've got to trawl the country. I think we've got to build partnerships with other agencies and frankly, there's a ton of work to be done in this area if we're going to stay up there with the top nations in the world. Otherwise, we're just going to slip down that pole. And once again, it'll be Great Britain first there. We were great, but then we slipped. So there is a massive, massive warning to the whole fraternity in disability swimming to get themselves sorted out. The expectation of British diving is very high these days due to the successes of the talented Tom Daly. What else can we expect from diving in the run-up to 2012? Look, I think diving uh, has got some massive potential. I mean, we saw, we had our best junior results in the Europeans. We had a double world champion in the world juniors. That's fantastic stuff. And I think there's some great diving programmes out there now. We've got some of our best facilities, Sheffield, Plymouth, uh, Southampton, Leeds, all working really well. We've got, uh, we've got South End coming on stream. We've got a new facility being built in London, a new facility being built in Edinburgh. So there's going to be some real hotbeds of diving. And I think as a nation, we've got fantastic facilities. We've got some great coaches. And I think there's some talented young lads and girls. And I think the, the important thing now is to get on, do the job. And I think we'll, we'll have a good crop of divers going forward. I've got no concerns about diving. I think it's a fantastic program, well managed and well run, and I think the future is bright. And I don't think we're looking at the Tom Daly diving team. I think we're looking at a fantastic Great Britain diving team. I think the future of diving in Britain is, is really bright. Um, we've got a world-class group of, of, of athletes. Um, we've got a very, very good coaching team who've brought some fresh ideas. And when I attended the recent uh, national championships in Sheffield, I was really impressed um, with the progress a number of clubs had made, but also divers like Monique Gladding and Megan Sylvester, and then just the recent progress by Jack Law, and this is his achievements um, at, at world level, really has give us great hope that um, they can make real progress. And again, we should be expecting success um, in 2012 and indeed beyond. Britain's synchronised swimmers have shown tremendous improvement over the past three years. How will British swimming continue this momentum and what work is being undertaken to ensure the next generation carries the sport forward beyond 2012? Synchro, without a shadow of doubt, has moved up from being almost a third world performer to being world class. But that has been about getting a handful of 
talented young people into a pool in Aldershot, working them hard and giving them the skills they need. What we now have to do is to build the talent pathway below and that's what we're working hard to do. We need better coaches in better clubs working the, the youngsters much harder, getting the core skills into them sooner, not coaching for the next performance but actually coaching core skills. We need better coaches, better clubs underpinning what we're doing at the world class level and that's what we're working on through the Beacon Programme Scheme. How is British swimming ensuring its water polo teams are best prepared for a home Olympics given the challenges faced by its sport? <laughs> it's an interesting uh, question that because in my mind if you look at uh, the women's team what we've done there is carried on the training program in Manchester because frankly that's what we have to do so they're effectively working really hard in Manchester getting the best possible support but we've also entered them as a team in the Hungarian Women's League. Now that will be tough because they have to go out there and they have to play a couple of games against some tough Hungarian competition and that will really strengthen them and make them more match fit. So that's quite innovative in my view and I think it's quite exciting. The men's another challenge because in water polo, as you know, the men's game is professional and we're a bit of an amateur body in some respects. And I recently went to the European Championships and perhaps the best amateur team is Russia and they came 11th. So that tells you it's really hard to break in. I bet it's a bit like Harrogate playing Chelsea in football terms. It's pretty tough. So what do we have to do about it? We, what we've done is we've sent our players out and we've placed them into European te teams. So they're now playing in clubs in Europe to make them tougher. So what we hope is that by actually placing them in, effectively, the Real Madrid and the, you know, I don't know what it is, I'm thinking of one now, Borussia Mönchengladbach or whatever, by placing them in top teams in Europe, which are essentially professional, uh, this will, again, toughen them up. And when they come back, they'll be better players than we could ever make them by leaving them in Manchester. So that's the tactic. But again, underpinning all that, we need to build a network of clubs which provide an extrusion press of talent for the future. Otherwise, this will just be a flash in the pan. And I've constantly said we need better coaches, better clubs, and more time for these players to develop. I'm delighted with the progress that Water Polo has made. Um, we had to take some very tough decisions. Um, there were a lot of angry people when funding was cut, but I think it was the right decision. We've refocused that program. Uh, we've done some really innovative things like getting the, the girls out to compete in the a league in Hungary, uh, which will raise their performance significantly, and they've demonstrated that um, through their performance in European Championships in the, the last year. Um, and then as far as the guys are concerned, um, by getting them out to play at a higher level of competitive intensity, um, again in foreign leagues, you can see the performance improvement. So there's no question the strategy that's been crafted out by the committee um, that the players have bought into, the coaches have bought into, is making progress. We're, you know, we're obviously at a challenging position in, in world rankings, but I'm delighted with the progress that's made, and it shows that tough love can be pretty effective sometimes.